Good afternoon to all of you. Good I'm afternoon. delighted to welcome all of you to this special webinar on the opportunities in Swiss and Europe market for processed food from Sri Lanka. I'm Yashrika and I will be the moderator for today's session. Let me provide a little introduction to this webinar series with the kind assistance of Switzerland Embassy in Sri Lanka and Swiss Import Promotion Program. Three market studies were carried out on value-added textile, fish and seafood, and processed food sectors of Sri Lanka to find out the opportunities in Swiss and Europe market. Currently, these three market studies have been successfully completed and the valuable insights highlighted from the studies have been presented through a series of webinars to Sri Lanka's exporters. Accordingly, this will be the final webinar of that series. With that note, let me cordially invite Dr. Kingsley Bernard, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Sri Lanka Export Development Board to deliver the welcome remarks. Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you, Yashika. On behalf of the Sri Lanka Export Development Board, it is my pleasure and privilege to welcome Mr. Raul Chadri Fayas, Embassy of Switzerland in Sri Lanka, Mr. Oliver Press, Deputy Head of Mission, Embassy of Switzerland in, in Sri Lanka, Mr. Clement Graf, uh, SIPO Head of Program Programs, Mr. Kasper Kaver, uh, SIPO Sector Export uh, Process Food. I'm, I'm, uh, my apologies if I have not pronounced your names properly. Sorry about it. Uh, and all the participants to the webinar and my staff at EDB. I would like to take this opportunity to extend our sincere thanks to the Embassy of Switzerland in Sri Lanka, Swiss Import Promotion Program, and the State Secretariat for Economic Affairs of Switzerland for providing this valuable benefit for Sri Lanka, for the Sri Lankan exporter community. Our sincere appreciation also goes to permanent mission of Sri Lanka to the WTO in Geneva for all the support provided in initiating this program. With the kind assistance of Embassy of Switzerland in Sri Lanka, Swiss Import Promotion Program facilitated EDB to carry out three comprehensive market research studies for selected Sri Lankan export product sectors namely value-added textiles, sustainable fish and seafood, and processed food aiming to be better integrate Sri Lanka into the world trade. We are grateful for SIPO for making arrangements to conduct these market research studies through competent, competent international sector exports to provide first-hand information on market access requirements to the EU market. We believe that the market studies are available and valuable opportunity to explore the potential for Sri Lanka to expand in the EU market. EU is Sri Lanka's second largest market by value which contributes for 24% of Sri Lanka's total export earnings at present. More than 6,000 products are eligible for zero duty access to the EU region under EU GSP Plus scheme. Sri Lanka has potential to expand the market share by entering into next untapped markets, enjoying the zero duty market access offered by the EU GSP scheme. EDB disseminated the research findings among Sri Lankan export community and related private and public sector organizations via series of online sectorial webinars. And this will be the final webinar of the series. The reports will also be made available in the EDB website for the benefit of the public. 
The webinar today, which is the last among the three webinars, is focusing on processed food sector. Processed food sector generate around 3% of the export revenue for Sri Lanka. And we observe that there are many SME manufacturers who have capacity and adhere to the international standards, who look forward to enter into the international market seeking the right opportunity. Therefore, I trust the market trends which will be highlighted during this webinar will be useful for the growth of the Sri Lanka's processed food sector. Finally, we extend our deepest appreciation to the Embassy of Switzerland in Sri Lanka, Swiss Import Promotion Program, State Secretariat of for Economic Affairs of Switzerland, all the participants and speakers who have dedicated their time and effort to make this webinar a success. Once again, a warm welcome to each one of you. We hope that this webinar will provide valuable insights on the opportunities for the proposed food sector. Last but not least, uh, my sincere thanks to the organizers, that is uh, EDB Marketing Development Department uh, Division. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, as mentioned earlier, Embassy of Switzerland in Sri Lanka extended a huge support in making this series of webinar a success. So uh, we would be honored to invite Mr. Raul Imbak, Charge D Affairs, Embassy of Switzerland in Sri Lanka, to address the audience. Thank you, Yashika. And uh, thank you, Chairman Kinsley, for these introductions. Um, we've been, we are now at the third of this seminar. And uh, when we started, when we signed the MOU, it was signed between EDB and Swiss Contact for the Swiss side. We were still at the heart of the financial and economical crisis in Sri Lanka. And we realized that those studies could really be a bridge for Sri Lanka to augment to augment its exports to Switzerland and the EU market. So a few months later, we are here um, to inaugurate those uh, three studies and actually the last one today on um, processed food products. And it's been a pleasure for the Swiss Embassy to assist uh, the EDB, SIPO, and Swiss contact uh, in getting these studies done and getting uh, to the inauguration and to the really practical uh, time of uh, for the users to be able to profit of these studies. So I want to, on my part, to thanks very much the EDB team. It's been a great support. You've been very active and very proactive help of uh, EDB and also of SIPO. Uh, it's been really proactive on all sides. And I think uh, we are now getting to the place where the actual users, uh, the, the entrepreneurs in those markets can use this information to export better in, to Switzerland and the EU market. So I just wish them a good webinar. I hope that you'll find what uh, you will be looking for what you thought this webinar will bring you and please refer also to the studies the studies as uh, you said uh, kinsley uh, are available on edb website and uh, they should be used uh, for helping you in your business that's all for me thank you again and have a good webinar thank you mr raul for your supportive words uh, Swiss Import Promotion Program, which is known as SIPO, facilitated EDB under their ad hoc support to non-SPO countries within the framework of its Economic Development Corporation to conduct these three comprehensive market studies. Without the support of Swiss Import Promotion Program, this project will not be a reality. So I would like to cordially invite Mr. Clement Graff, Sipo, Head of Program, to speak a few words on this initiative. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shika, for your kind introduction. Uh, from my side, I will be very brief. I would just like to extend my uh, gratitude to Dr. Kinsley Bernard for being present here today. I also like to express my, my very high appreciation of the work and the collaboration we could have with EDB during the conduct of the studies in the process of uh, selecting the right sectors, in the pro process of selecting the right product groups and markets. EDB has really been incremental and the support has been uh, exemplary uh, throughout all the stages of uh, this project. So a uh, big thank you to you and your team for that support. Then also from my side, of course, I would like to uh, extend my thanks to the, the Swiss Embassy. Uh, Swiss Import Promotion Program operates in 11 countries out of Switzerland. So we have local presence in, in 11 countries, not, however, in Sri Lanka. So the support uh, uh, on, on site by the Swiss Embassy, especially in the preparation of the whole project, with the contracts and the administrative parts has been uh, very, very valuable and highly appreciated. So big thank you uh, to Raoul Imbach and his team at the Swiss Embassy for supporting us. Then, of course, the Swiss Import Promotion Program, SIPO. We only work successfully um, if we have a, a, uh, the ability to uh, mobilize and to um, work with highly competent consultants. We have an international network of consultants who are sector specialists, market specialists in export promotion, in bridging the last mile from export ready producers with great products to help them find the right buyers in Switzerland and in Europe. So my thanks also to uh, Kasper, uh, who is present today and who will hold the seminar, who's also been uh, a crucial part, of course, in, in conducting the studies and in realizing uh, those. So big thank you uh, there as well. And last but not least, of course, uh, my greetings to all of the participating um, companies and organizations who uh, take an interest in uh, what we have to share uh, with you today. I really hope that we can contribute uh, to your uh, success in exporting your great valuable product to the right markets in Europe. And I wish you a, uh, a good, a good and insightful uh, seminar. And, uh, with that, I, I hand back to you, Yashika. Thank you, Mr. Clement, for your encouraging words. So uh, this webinar series is jointly organized by SIPO and EDB with the objective of making awareness on the opportunities in Swiss and Europe market for Sri Lanka's exporters. Therefore, uh, we will now post a poll which will evaluate your current knowledge level on the processed food um, sector. We invite all the participants to take a few minutes to answer this poll before starting the presentation. Hope all of you has uh, responded to the poll. So it's time to invite the SIPO sector expert for processed food, uh, Mr. Kasper Kerber, to conduct the presentation. Uh, Mr. Kasper Kerber um, is a market analyst at Profound. Uh, he is a specialist in market research for processed foods and natural ingredients in developing countries with over 15 years of experience. He also frequently meets exporters locally at trade fairs and online. Therefore, he understands common challenges well uh, and can give practical tips on how to turn market intelligence into actions. Before handing over to Mr. Casper, uh, let me remind you some formalities during the webinar. We highly encourage active participation and engagement from all the participants throughout the webinar. You can raise your questions from our uh, expert using the Q&A feature in the bottom of your screen. 
and also there will be some questions directed to you as polls and you can click on the correct answer for multiple answer questions. So with that note, um, the floor is open to you, Casper. Thank you, Yashika. Uh, let me first uh, share my screen with you. And if you could please confirm that you can see my screen. Yes, it is visible. All right. Thanks. Uh, all right. Just uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been involved in uh, trade promotion uh, in many different countries for, for more than 15 years now. Um, mainly providing training and coaching to companies that want to enter the European market or expand their business on the European market and focusing on um, natural ingredients and processed foods and uh, also focusing on yeah, socially responsible uh, business or sustainable uh, business. And maybe good to note that we as Profound Consultancy based in the Netherlands uh, are also involved in the Good Life X program in Sri Lanka. So we have a bit of a background uh, of the sector in, uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, how it's performing and what are, um, let's say, the, the capacities uh, in your country. This is, uh, yeah, the agenda for the presentations today, it's very simple. Uh, I will start with a sort of a general introduction on trends in the processed food sector as a whole in Europe. Uh, and then I will provide some more details about four specific products. Those are jackfruit, um, a virgin coconut oil, dried banana and dried pineapple. And those are the four products that we have also focused on in the market studies. Um, basically, the, the market uh, study con consists of four chapters on these four different um, products. And there is a part on the general processed food sector in uh, Europe. Um, after each of these uh, product-specific presentations, I would like to have a moment for the Q&A, questions and answers. So during the presentation, you can just write your, your questions in the Q&A as uh, Yashika informed you. And then after each of the four uh, chapters, I will have a moment to answer um, those questions. Okay, starting with the general trends for the processed food sector. So this refers to all kinds of processed foods. Um, there are some very like long-term trends, European consumers looking for healthy products, looking for, for natural products. But let's say the last uh, few years, some of the hot topics that are mentioned a lot are, um, are mentioned here. Um, a lot is coming from concerns about the climate, climate change, um, with um, consumers uh, yeah, uh, having real concerns about that and also thinking about what they can do to you know, um, combat the climate change or uh, adapt or, or mitigate. Um, and some of the topics that are also relevant for you are uh, for example, the um, uh, wish of a lot of consumers to reduce the use of plastics. And this is particularly relevant, of course, for the, for the packaging of your products. Um, we already see some countries in Europe taking very strict measures to reduce plastics um, in packaging. Uh, with the most concrete example in Spain, that has now introduced an import tax for plastics where importers, those are your buyers, your clients in Europe, they will have to pay uh, per kilogram of plastic packaging. And that comes with a lot of administration and with a lot of costs for the importers. And so the importers will ask uh, you as their suppliers to 
minimize plastic use or, or preferably even eliminate it when possible. Other uh, hot topics are uh, yeah, reduction in food waste, but that's particularly relevant for uh, the food industry in Europe. Um, the shift to plant-based diets, and I will um, tell you more about that uh, later because it's relevant for um, for some of the products that uh, that you are exporting and that we are that we have focused on in the research. Organic products uh, are hot. That market is still growing. I will also provide some more data on that. Um, people are very interested in reducing energy use. So consumers themselves are trying to reduce energy, but also buyers here in Europe appreciate it when their suppliers can show that they're actively reducing energy use. And then of course, it's mainly uh, energy from fossil fuels. Uh, and two other um, hot topics right now are uh, the transparency, increased transparency in supply chains and the, uh, the, the healthiness of uh, processed foods. Um, but that latter one is, is really, that, that's been, let's say, taking shape for decades already. And it continues to be uh, a major trend. Very important in the coming years in Europe is the, um, the EU Green Deal. And the EU Green Deal is a set of um, policies, uh, laws, uh, action plans of the European Union uh, to yeah, transform the EU into a climate neutral and resource efficient economy by 2050. And this Green Deal is, um, is like, it's a huge in all aspects. And it, uh, it covers all sectors and it will affect all businesses and all consumers uh, in the EU. And it will also affect suppliers from outside the EU. And if we talk about processed foods, the elements of the European Green Deal that are most relevant are the farm to fork uh, strategy and also uh, two new directives, uh, which are the uh, corporate uh, sustain corporate social reporting directive <laughs> and the due diligence supply chain act. Um, and these um, aim to, uh, first of all, um, increase transparency in supply chains and make sure that what is happening, that uh, importers in Europe are aware of what is happening in their supply chains. So also the supply chains outside the EU. Um, we expect that later on, um, the legislation will become more strict and uh, importers in Europe will also have to act on what they see is not sustainable in their supply chains. So if there is an issue in their supply chain, for example, use of toxic uh, agrochemicals, uh, if, they, if they are aware of that, that they also have to do something about it. We're not there yet. The EU now says European importers, they just have to be aware. They have to um, actively uh, monitor their supply chains, um, um, and really build up knowledge about how their supply chains work, what's happening in their supply chains, but they don't really have to act yet. That is probably the next stage. At this moment, um, in terms of the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, the only the very big companies um, with let's say more than 500 employees have to prepare a, a sustainability report according to legislation um, to, to report on the sustainability issues in their, in their business and in their supply chains. And smaller companies are exempt for now 
because it's an administ administrative burden. And um, of course, the EU is careful in not making it too difficult at the moment for, let's say, SMEs to comply with this legislation. But we can expect in the future, um, let's say in a decade from now, <laughs> that also smaller European companies will have to report on sustainability. And that means for you as suppliers that you will have to probably provide more information to your buyers in Europe on different sustainability issues. Um, and you can always divide it into two categories. It's related to environmental sustainability. For example, those agrochemicals, uh, used uh, um, uh, in agriculture, uh, and it's on social uh, responsibility, uh, so that you're taking good care of the people working in, in your company and in your supply chains. So expect more questions from European companies on uh, sustainability issues and to for you to provide data to them. One of the elements of the EU Green Deal is to promote um, yeah, organic agriculture. And um, the EU wants to promote organic agriculture, uh, especially within Europe, but also uh, worldwide. And uh, yeah, for Europe, for agriculture, farming in Europe, they've set a target for the share of land um, that's under organic agriculture by 2030. So in about seven years from now. And um, the poll is already up. So I'm asking you to estimate what that uh, share is. So if you have total agricultural land in Europe, how much of that land should be under organic agriculture by 2030? Is that 5%, 15%, 25% or 35% of land? I'll give you a moment to think about it. <laughs> I believe Mr. Lahiru of EDB can see how many answers have come in. So when a good number of answers has come in, please publish the results. All right, thanks. Um, I see that a good amount of you is, is already informed then about uh, these plans, these ambitions of the EU, because um, what is it? 58% of you uh, give the correct answer of 25%. Um, this is a huge amount of, uh, of land, 25% uh, of all agricultural land in the EU to be certified organic by 2030 in just seven years from now. Um, it's an ambitious target because we're, we're definitely not there yet. It's more in the range of five to 10% now, um, but the EU is heavily promoting this. And yeah, this gives us a bit of insight into the, the future for the, for the organic sector in particular. Um, if the EU wants such a, sh a large share of lands to be organic certified in the EU, uh, the organic market will also have to be promoted. So there will be a lot of promotion to 
stimulate consumers in Europe to buy organic products. And those products can come from Europe itself, but they could also come from Sri Lanka, obviously. So there's a opportunity there to supply organic certified uh, products. All right, um, that uh, finishes the, let's say the general part on the processed uh, foods um, sector trends. And now I will dive a bit deeper into specific products of relevance for, uh, for you. And the first one is jackfruit, which is um, of course a very well-known product in Sri Lanka, but not that well-known in Europe actually. Um, it's uh, currently a niche uh, product. Not all consumers know about it. That will also mean that if you put it on the market, sometimes you will have to sort of explain <laughs> what it is and, and what people can do with it. Um, since it's such a niche product in Europe, um, the data, trade data available for, um, let's say, uh, processed uh, jackfruit to Europe is very limited. Um, so we have looked more into uh, general data for processed uh, fruits and vegetables um, and uh, looked at more qualitative data. And yeah, you can see that the, the bigger countries in Europe are also the main um, consumption markets. And those are especially like Germany, France, um, UK, also Poland. And, uh, and the Netherlands is there because the Netherlands is a big importer in Europe, um, especially also for exotic fruits, like fresh fruits, um, including fresh jackfruit. But it's not the topic that we re researched. Huh? We, we looked into processed foods, processed jackfruit. Uh, but also in that market, um, uh, uh, the Netherlands plays uh, a uh, significant role next to those mo major consumption markets, Germany, France, uh, UK, and Poland. And um, those uh, are also markets that are quite interested in, in uh, let's say, relatively new products, um, yeah, considering that for Europe, Jackfruit is quite new. Uh, these are markets that are open to try such new products. We see in general that in Southern Europe, they are a bit more uh, conservative, let's say, in trying such new products. Um, in Scandinavia, there's also definitely interest in trying new products, um, but those are you know, smaller in populations. So in terms of trade statistics, you don't see them show up that well. And um, yeah, a, a bit of introduction before uh, maybe you answer this uh, uh, poll. Um, jackfruit has an interesting new market application um, and that is to use it in uh, vegetarian products. Uh, so vegetarians are uh, people who don't eat uh, meat and um, jackfruit having a meat-like texture uh, can be used as a, a, in meat replacements. And that makes this, this market for, for meat replacements and the, the markets where vegetarians uh, purchase their, uh, their products very interesting. Um, I've looked into some numbers for the share of vegetarians in the total populations. So how many people out of the total population uh, do not eat meat and so look for alternatives, uh, including Germany being a major vegetarian market. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I've got a poll here. Uh, how many consumers in Germany are vegetarians? Is it 4%, 9%, 13%, or 19%?
And I myself would also be very interested in knowing the percentage of vegetarians in Sri Lanka. All right, uh, results of the poll. Mm, most people answering 9% or 13%. Uh, and the correct answer is 9%. So we were very close. Very good. 9% uh, up from more like 5% about, I think, less than 10 years ago. So it has increased a lot in the number of vegetarians, the, men, in the number of people that um, want to try and yeah avoid meat completely. There's also the term flexitarians that you might have heard about. Uh, those are people that try and eat less, uh, that try to eat less meat. Uh, not completely avoiding meat uh, altogether, but trying to um, to reduce their meat consumption. And uh, Germany is, let's say, one of the front runners here uh, with 9% um, vegetarians already. Uh, many other countries yeah, following uh, that same trend. And yeah, all those people are looking for, for replacements because they're, they have cooking habits, you know, they um, uh, they often prepare like say uh, uh, potatoes with carbs, um, then uh, some vegetables uh, and a piece of meat. And that's what they're used to, 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 to prepare as a meal. And if you want to take out the meat, then they're like, yeah, we want something uh, to replace that meat. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, development going on, products development uh, to come up with meat replacements. And those are products that sometimes really look like meat and taste like meat, or they're uh, what we also see more and more now is that they're just products that contain the same nutrients, mostly proteins, but they have their unique, you know, uh, appearance uh, and taste. Uh, and how does this then, yeah, relate to um, to um, uh, jackfruit? Well, if you have, for example, canned uh, jackfruit chunks, then, uh, as I said, uh, they have quite similar texture as uh, some some meats, um, and they absorb flavors quite well. And that's interesting for food manufacturers in Europe because then they can have the texture of meat and add flavors to also make it taste like meat or at least to give it an interesting taste for Europeans. Uh, Europeans have a certain taste. Um, we, we are used to certain flavors. So manufacturers can also add those flavors. Uh, and make the product uh, acceptable for European consumers. All right. Um, so uh, uh, this is a, a, a summary of, um, uh, let's say, interesting findings for European jackfruit markets. A lot of demand uh, for natural products. Jackfruit fits in well. It's a versatile uh, product, like I said, it mixes well with spices uh, and other flavorings. It has this meaty texture, so it can substitute, replace meat. Uh, and also good is that uh, it does not contain uh, yeah, allergens, um, with a lot of people in Europe also uh, having allergies and, and, and avoiding um, uh, products that contain certain uh, allergens. So, uh, yeah, we see a small but definitely growing market for jackfruit, especially in these uh, the countries that we just showed, Germany, UK, France, Poland, with uh, the Netherlands as an important uh, trading hub. Uh, and in terms of demographics, it's really the younger consumers that find it very interesting to experiment with new products, uh, including, let's say, jackfruit-based uh, meat replacements. In terms of 
how the trade works, how to get products, uh, jackfruit products on the European market to, to European customers. Um, we've seen that, um, yeah, restaurants are now um, really experimenting with jackfruit as a meat substitute, but also there's definitely a lot of food manufacturers now that are trying to skill up uh, the use of jackfruit as meat replacements. Um, and also uh, within the larger retailers, uh, supermarkets, also e-commerce uh, retailers, they, um, they are expanding their jackfruit uh, range. Um, and uh, yeah, we've provided some examples here of uh, companies mm, that are um, developing new products with, uh, with jackfruit. And yeah, so it's all about creating a product that is interesting for the European consumers. And if you just provide like jackfruit in, in a can or, or dried uh, uh, jackfruit, then consumers often don't know what to do with it because they, they don't know what it is, how to use it. Um, so there's a big role for the, well, different value chain players retailers, food manufacturers, to explain to consumers in Europe how to use it. Um, so there's a lot of also recipe development using uh, and the names of famous chefs in Europe to show how to make an interesting recipe with jackfruit. Um, and uh, yeah, the food manufacturers are making it easier for consumers by already developing um, ready-to-eat products uh, like burgers based on jackfruit. In the Netherlands, we have um, a retail chain called Albert Heijn. That's uh, the major uh, retail chain here, supermarkets. Um, they, are, they have also a number of jackfruit products in their product assortment. And um, yeah, I have a question for you. How many products do you think that this retail chain uh, offers? Uh, how many jackfruit-based products offers leading retail chain Albert Heijn in the Netherlands? Is that zero, one, five, or eight? I guess answers are still coming in. Okay, can we have the results? Thanks. All right. Uh, yeah, a few people said uh, still zero, maybe based on <laughs> that I explained that it's a new product. Uh, also a few one, but most uh, five, uh, which is indeed uh, the, the correct 
answer and I can show you uh, which uh, products are currently offered uh, um, on the Albert Heijn webshop online. And you can see it's uh, three uh, canned uh, uh, products. Um, so it's one is like just young uh, uh, jackfruit pieces. And the only one is called pulled young uh, jackfruit. Um, uh, pulled for like pulled, pulled meat. Which you can also make from uh, yeah from other type from real types of meat. Pulled pork is a very let's say famous dish in the in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, we have one burger patty, a burger patty based on jackfruit uh, with some other ingredients in it. So it's ready to use. And there is a um, ready to eat meal. Uh, including jackfruit, a biryani uh, meal, including jackfruit as meat replacement. And yeah, I just want to show you uh, in case you are maybe considering to develop ready to eat products for the European market, thereby definitely adding value, that Europeans are actually quite used to highly processed food with a lot of ingredients in it. Um, so for these burgers, um, they use mainly wheat proteins uh, and then also jackfruit uh, for texture and proteins. And next to that, there's sunflower oil, is the different vegetables, uh, uh, even seaweed, flour, fibers, flavors, yeast extracts, then it, there's texturizers like thickeners, uh, salts, uh, acidity regulator, um, some more spices, uh, vinegar powder for uh, preservation, uh, and even added minerals and vitamins. It's quite a huge amount of, uh, of ingredients. Um, and it's, uh, it's really quite big food manufacturers that research consumer preferences in terms of like taste, um, and then develop these products, uh, considering the, the texture, the flavor, the nutrient content, um, and even the the shelf life of products. And then they come up with all these ingredients to make a burger that answers to the expectations of European consumers. And so, yeah, if you want to develop something yourself, uh, be aware that um, these food manufacturers in Europe are very close to the market. They know what European consumers expect. They, they have a lot of uh, also um, knowledge on product development. They have access to all these um, um, uh, raw materials. And so it might be better to team up with them uh, and use their resources to develop such a burger uh, instead of trying to, to um, develop something yourself. Um, uh, because it's, uh, yeah, it's a challenge to make a, a burger patty that answers to the expectations of European consumers. Okay, a little bit on price and quality. Uh, in the low end uh, segment, um, yeah, you can see a lot of these canned uh, jackfruits where prices range for uh, between three and five um, euros per kilogram, and in the in the high end uh, markets, you see a bit more uh, value added products like these burger patties, like minced meats, like ready to eat meals. Um, but also, for example, organic certified or um, somehow premium quality uh, jackfruit, and then prices range from eight to fifteen euros per kilogram. Okay, so the major opportunities, uh, summarizing this for jackfruit, uh, are definitely the trend towards uh, vegetarianism, uh, meat replacements, uh, plant-based diets, 
a lot of development there, a lot of food manufacturers looking now for ingredients uh, to develop such uh, uh, products, meat replacements. Um, it's good to partner with European companies for that product development and to help also promote the product amongst European consumers since they still don't really know it and know how to use it. Yeah, and it's always good to visit European trade fairs um, to, to better understand um, the requirements of European consumers and European uh, food manufacturers. And there you could also try out your prototype. So if you are developing a product, a value-added jack-based product, you can also see the response from the market. Do people like it? Eh? What, uh, how do they... Uh, perceive the taste of your products. Uh, and taste is key to make um, jackfruit a successful product in Europe. And then taste is, uh, is about flavor and texture. All right, so that's the first part. I realize I'm a bit over time, by the way, so I have to be a bit quicker for the other products. Um, but I do want to take a moment to answer questions that you may have. I've seen that there's a couple of uh, questions not necessarily related to uh, jackfruit. So let me have a look. Um, there's a question on um, ketal syrup, if there is a place for that product. So it's a very different product. I can say I have researched the market for ketal syrup in Europe before. Um, at that time, it was very niche, very new, not many people knowing about it. But I do know that recently demand for alternative sweeteners, so alternative to sugars, has increased. So um, uh, I expect that uh, at the moment, demand for keto syrup should be quite good. There's a question on bananas, but I'm going to present a little bit more about dried bananas later. So I'd like to um, put that, uh, to park that question for a moment. Um, there's a question on PGIs, protected geographic indications. If there is demand, uh, good demand for PGIs in, in Europe, um, and then relating that to cinnamon and, uh, and tea. Um, there is definitely good demand for products with PGIs. Uh, it's a very strong way to position your product as a unique product because you can make a real claim that it is unique. With a PGI, you can say, look, <laughs> our product is unique. This is the, this is the evidence. Uh, and we see it in all uh, product categories, um, including spices. Uh, so for cinnamon, that's relevant. And also for teas. Uh, and I think uh, that is uh, definitely an interesting strategy. To, to have a PGI for those products um, to better um, distinguish it from, you know, commodities on the market. And so to avoid uh, competition on price only. Okay. Oh, there's a lot of questions now. I have to, <laughs> I'm going to pick out the ones on um, jackfruit. Uh, how about baby jackfruit? Um, or that, I, I'm not sure if you refer to like young, young jackfruit or really a different type of jackfruit. Because um, uh, the, the young jackfruit is the type we often see in the, uh, in the canned uh, category of canned products between the canned beans and other canned vegetables uh, with the, the young jackfruit having the, um, let's say the most interesting texture for European consumers. I think uh, Upamali has uh, referred to young jackfruit. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, and so it's all, uh, for jackfruit, it's all about the texture. The texture is what has sort of made jackfruit 
um, yeah, an interesting uh, product, and um, and it's the young jackfruit uh, that is most uh, most appreciated for that texture. Um, I see a question on organic certificates. Um, I yeah okay. Um, the question is, what are the main points in organic certification? Um, that's difficult to answer now because um, uh, basically I could fill a two-hour presentation <laughs> on the EU organic certification. Um, I uh, yeah, I'm not sure how to answer that. Like. Most important is that you have the EU uh, organic certificate. Uh, the, I'm sure that in Sri Lanka you have your own organic standard, national standard. Um, but Europeans just want the EU organic standard. Uh, also in Switzerland, also in Switzerland, buyers use the EU organic standard. And they want the certificate preferably to be issued by a certification body that is well known in Europe. Um, and there is a few, um, but I think the, um, the most well known, well recognized one is EcoCert. Uh, but there's also, for example, Control Union and uh, well, there's a lot more. <laughs> um, but it's important to check that the certification body that you use uh, yeah, is known in Europe and, and preferably has like, you know, headquarters in Europe. That is, that is maybe a good tip. I see a question on um, EU permitted additives. Uh, that's a good one. Because um, for processed foods, you can definitely use uh, uh, additives. But there is a there is a regulation uh, on the use of additives and including a positive list of um, of additives. And if I'm not mistaken, that regulation is mentioned in the document in the study. So if you if you see the study uh, and you go to the part on bio requirements, you will also see part on additives, and then you should be able to go to the regulation and find that positive list of, um, of additives. And one of the relevant ones is, um, is like uh, for um, sulfites to prevent, for example, the browning of uh, processed uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, which, which are allowed in conventional uh, products, uh, but for example, not in organic products. Uh, so if you're considering uh, organic products, then um, um, uh, you have to be aware that you cannot use the same, let's say, processing aids uh, or preservatives to, uh, for example, preserve the color of your um, processed fruits and vegetables. Uh, there is a question, and I think this is the last one for jackfruit, and then I want to continue to uh, VCO. And there's a question on consumers, if they have a preference for sweet jackfruit products over spicy ones. Uh, in general, European consumers like sweet products. <laughs> We're used to consume a lot of sugar. Uh, only if it comes to like meat replacements to be to be used in in meals, then um, um, products don't necessarily have to be very sweet. Uh, sweetness is of course more important for like snacks and you know and candy and uh, and a lot of uh, soft drinks and and and, and juices. Uh, but in meals, uh, products can be spicy, only many consumers are not used to the same level of spiciness, <laughs> pungency, 
as people in uh, in Sri Lanka. <laughs> so you have to be aware that a lot of consumers want more like mild uh, spiciness, <laughs> not too hot. All right, um, maybe I can come back to some still pending questions later. Yeah, but for now I'd like to continue with the presentation. And continuing with uh, VCO, virgin coconut oil. That market has grown a lot in the past uh, six, seven years. Uh, as you can see yeah, in the data here, grew from a market of 690 million. That's, by the way, it's not just VCO, that's all um, coconut oils, uh, to 1.28 billion. And there's a few reasons for that growth. Um, it, it was in 2020 and 2021 because of COVID-19. Uh, people were looking for healthier products, uh, hoping that by eating more healthy products, they would uh, improve their, um, uh, what is it? Um, uh, the, the, the system that you have to, to prevent from getting sick. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, VCO is considered in Europe a, a healthy alternative for many other vegetable oils and butters. And so, yeah, uh, that was one of the reasons. More recently, it's because of the war in Ukraine, because Ukraine is a major producer of uh, sunflower oil. And so production of sunflower oil has gone down, um, or at least is threatened. And because it's uh, threatened and not so secure, the supplies of sunflower oil, we see that manufacturers in Europe are uh, also switching to other oils. Uh, and one of them could be um, uh, VCO. Uh, and the third reason is that there is a trend going on for replacing palm oil, um, where palm oil is associated by a lot of people with the climate crisis. So the palm oil plantations um, that, um, that are often like uh, monocultures um, uh, where, yeah, uh, there's, there's a, there's, there have been a lot of sustainability issues around palm oils for quite a long time already and little progress is seen there. Um, and there's been a lot of reports in Europe about those sustainability issues. And now we do see that consumers are uh, actively trying to avoid palm oil consumption because those issues are not resolved. So uh, you even see products in Europe claiming uh, to be palm oil free. Uh, and then again, manufacturers, they need the, the oils and fats for their products. So they're switching to other vegetable oils and fats. And again, that could be VCO. Uh, within Europe, uh, the Netherlands uh, is again an uh, important trade country. Um, uh, Germany is an important trade country and also consumer with a huge uh, food industry. Um, also with a huge uh, vegetable oil processing industry, like refining industry. Um, Belgium is similar like Europe, uh, also a lot of trade, not a major consumption market maybe because of the population size, but playing an important role in the trade. And um, um, yeah, other countries uh, that are that have big consumption markets are France, uh, UK, Poland. Um, uh, yeah, and Poland again. Zooming in on yeah, two of the main importing countries, uh, Germany and the Netherlands. Uh, in uh, Germany, uh, we see that a lot of young consumers like mentioned before, they are most concerned about the climate crisis and about environmental issues. 
and they are actively looking for sustainable products, palm oil free uh, products, for example. Um, and so they are interested in these alternatives like VCO. And uh, whereas in Europe, uh, whereas in the Netherlands, uh, it's more about the, the, the trade hub function with a lot of bigger importers in Europe that are also re-exporting again to other countries um, uh, by breaking bulk, but sometimes also by adding value through refining, through um, um, uh, using those uh, VCO and, and other vegetable oils in products to then re-export those uh, more processed products to other countries. Um, the outlook for VCO sector is quite good with 9% uh, growth between 2020 and 2028. And yeah, it's a very versatile ingredient, VCO. Uh, in our study, we focus on the food sector, but we also see that VCO is used in health products and in the cosmetics uh, sector, in beauty uh, products. Uh, so those could also be markets uh, that you can um, uh, you can you can aim at. Uh, and, and yeah, maybe good to to mention that um, Fisio is considered an interesting uh, alternative to palm oil, and is considered as a yeah as a sustainably produced uh, product uh, from coconuts. But it's always good to have the evidence that your product is sustainable. <clears throat> and there, um, uh, yeah, Rainforest Alliance is good to mention. That's another certification scheme um, that uh, has gained importance in the coconut, well, in the coconut sector, including the coconut oil uh, sector. And with the certificate from Rainforest Alliance, uh, you can have evidence that your production is sustainable and then benefit from that interest in sustainable products. In terms of trade distribution of products to consumers, um, there's, uh, yeah, there's two, two segments. Uh, it's the, <clears throat> the European um, the consumer market. So, uh, providing just VCO uh, in in a jar uh, to retailers, uh, which sell it uh, to consumers to be used as um, as like cooking oil uh, or as an ingredient uh, that they use for, uh, for for salads or whatever meals they prepare at home. That's one segment. The other segment is uh, is the food industry, with also the food industry um, uh, using. Um, VCO more, not to the same extent as palm oil uh, or um, sunflower oil or soy oil. Uh, those are those are the commodity oils being used in the food industry. But there are definitely some food manufacturers that find the specific properties of VCO, especially the taste, uh, interesting, and they want to pay a bit more compared to these other major commodity oils for VCO. Uh, so that's more the high-end uh, food manufacturers that's, that are interested in VCO. Um, yeah, and um, since VCO is more of a niche product still, we see small volumes being traded. And that means the, the bulk has to be broken down uh, for for the smaller food manufacturers. So we have quite long chains, supply chains, distribution chains to get uh, VCO to the food manufacturers. Um, yeah, that's it for uh, VCO. And then I have another poll for you. Um, uh, so, VCO is uh, sold um, directly to retailers uh, or through retailers to consumers. Uh, and in the Netherlands, Albert Heijn, the retail chain plays an important role in that distribution. And to 
uh, yeah, I already explained uh, that VCO can be used as an alternative to other oils. So question for you is, what are then the main competitor products for VCO uh, sold as such through a leading retail chain like Albert Heijn in the Netherlands? And then in terms of your marketing, if you know what are the competitor products, you can also see how those products are positioned in the market, what claims are being made, um, what information is uh, provided to consumers um, so that you can use that for your own marketing for, for VCO. Thanks. Yeah, it's a multiple choice uh, answer. So you, you uh, it doesn't add up to 100% here. Um, most people are saying sunflower oil and olive oil as alternatives. All right. And if I'm not mistaken, that is indeed correct. Um, this is like a screenshot of the web shop of this retailer, Albert Heijn, with uh, on top uh, the VCO products that they offer. So you see a lot of just like jars um, with VCO in it and nothing else, just pure VCO. And then on the bottom, <clears throat> you see these uh, four different products, not VCO. Uh, and th this is a suggestion by the web shop for consumers looking for VCO um, to also consider alternatives. And you see it's a mostly uh, olive oil. There's three olive oil products there and, um, and sunflower oil. And that's because uh, many consumers in Europe will use the VCO for cooking uh, and maybe for... Um, like say for, for use in salads, dressings. Uh, and uh, those consumers also use a lot of olive oil and sunflower oil. With quite, quite similar properties, um, but VCO having a very high, what is it like? Um, uh, it can withstand very high temperatures. So it's very good for, for baking. Okay, in terms of price and quality, uh, yeah, VCO is very expensive uh, product compared to other oils, and therefore it, uh, yeah, it still remains a niche product, uh, very, uh, quite exclusive. Um, but we see changes eh, that uh, the price is going down and the volumes are increasing, so the gap is getting a bit smaller, but still. <laughs> Uh, it's like two or three times more expensive than um, than, uh, than some of these other oils. Um, in terms of quality, buyers really look at um, appearance, at the color. Should be as white as possible when solid. And remember that here in Europe, uh, temperatures are lower. Uh, I think the melting point is around 28 degrees or something. Um, so in European uh, uh, supermarkets, the product will normally be um, uh, solid and then have this white color. Uh, taste is important. It has a nutty coconut uh, taste, which some consumers like, others don't. So there's a certain group of consumers that find it interesting. 
uh, yeah, and same for the smell. And uh, we see that the lower quality VCO on the market um, has more, let's say more color, a bit grayish, yellowish. Um, do uh, note that often the white color is only feasible after refining, after like um, also deodorizing uh, and bleaching the product. Uh, there is a group of consumers that does not want such processing and, and they are fine with, with grayish, yellowish uh, Fisio because they know that then it's not deodorized and bleached. Um, yeah, the retail prices for Fisio uh, currently range between 10 and 18 euros per, per kilogram to give you an indication. And then finally for VCO, looking at opportunities. And so uh, uh, VCO benefits from the health trend, especially since uh, COVID. Um, it remains quite exclusive, expensive, but for a growing group of consumers looking for sustainable products, alternatives to palm oil, um it's uh, yeah it's an interesting alternative even at that price point um so the market is expected to continue to grow and yeah uh, it can be used in the in the food market but also consider these other markets of for health products and uh, and cosmetics and uh, um, maybe make note of the sustainable coconut and coconut oil round table. Um, so promoting uh, the sustainable um, production and trade of coconut products and considering the huge interest in sustainable products in Europe, it's good to be associated also with such initiatives and look what they are doing and get uh, inspiration ideas for how to make your own uh, uh, production and trade more sustainable to answer to those consumer needs. Okay, I'm going to skip that one because of time. I see it's almost 12. And um, I'm not sure like uh, until what time <laughs> I can uh, I can take. And Yashika, can, can you give me an indication because um, there is still a lot of questions and I could present more about the two other products. Can you give me an indication of how much time I can use? It is better if we could uh, uh, conclude uh, within another 10 minutes time. Yeah. All right. Okay. Then what I suggest is that uh, I take some time for questions, uh, for the questions and the answers that are already in the Q&A section of Zoom. And um, I think, Casper, uh, we can um, uh, answer those questions at the end of the webinar. OK, so I take 10 more minutes uh, to discuss the other two products. Yes. Yes, all right. OK. Um, and these are two uh, very similar products uh, in terms of um, markets, at least. Dried banana and dried pineapple. Um, they go to the same segment in European markets, uh, which is the, um, uh, let's say that the market for, um, uh, for snacks, ready to eat snacks. Um, so like banana chips sweetened or not in a, in a bag that you, uh, that you can snack on the way. Uh, and um, there's also a segment for like mueslis and muesli bars. Muesli bars also being snacks and mueslis, granolas uh, being like breakfast cereals. So these markets have very, a lot of uh, similarities. Um, they're not the most um, dynamic markets, not growing a lot. Quite, quite stable, but um, yeah, still performing, 
let's say performing well um, because there is there remains a very good demand uh, for such snacks and breakfast cereals um, looking at time I'm going to skip uh, this one I just want to uh, mention how important it is to have the right processing in place for dried fruits, be it dried bananas or dried pineapple. Um, it's really about minimizing the change in, um, in, in taste from the fresh products. So if you have fresh banana and you dry it, you want to, to have a minimum change in taste. <laughs> Um, of course, your uh, your drying so it, it becomes m more hard. Where fresh banana, fresh pineapple is soft, so the texture really changes. Um, but in terms of taste and um, color, you want it to remain as close to the original as possible, and that means you have to find a drying technique. Yeah, that that allows uh, for such minimum change. And often the more control you have over the process, and that means control of temperature, control of airflow, control of uh, drying time, um, control of the, um, um, what is it? The, um, um, the, the exposure of the, of the surface of the fruit to air, uh, by, for example, turning the product, the more control you have over those variables in the drying process, um, the better you will be able to tweak the process to get the optimum uh, product. And so like oven dryers in a uh, closed uh, uh, container, uh, where you can set the temperature, you can set the time, you can set maybe the, the airflow, things like that. Uh, they, they work best to get, you get the best quality. Where drying in the open air, yeah, uh, that's a simple sort of effective technique, but you have no control over, over the sun. Um, uh, it doesn't, uh, the, the product, you don't turn it around maybe when you dry it in the open air. Um, you don't have uh, control over airflow, things like that. So usually the product quality um, is not as good. And so if you are targeting uh, premium markets, uh, really try to get maximum control of that, uh, of that process. Yeah, another poll in one minute. So which of the following statements are true? And this relates to the quality of dried uh, banana, but actually it also applies to uh, pineapple. Um, which of the, uh, the statements are true? Consumers expect dried banana to be sweet. Uh, consumers expect dried banana to be brown. Consumers expect dried banana to be chewy or consumers expect dried banana to contain preservatives. Which statements are true? Shall we check the answers? Yes, please. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. It's, uh, it's quite quite a lot of people 
answered for the different statements that they're true, especially for sweet. Yeah, that's that's correct. Uh, I, I told you before that a lot of consumers are used to sweet products to consume also a lot of sugar. Um, also a lot of uh, uh, people answering chewy. Uh, actually, um, a lot of consumers, they, um, um, they want a, a texture which is not so chewy. So uh, in terms of dried bananas, to get dried banana, that's, um, um, yeah, that is simply not true. I don't know how to, <laughs> how to explain it otherwise, but it is, it has a, a, a texture, um, that does not require you to chew for a long time. Um, brown, um, uh, maybe in the organic market, yes, then consumers accept it. But in the conventional markets, consumers don't expect brown fruits because they associate it with the, uh, the enzymatic uh, process of browning, uh, which means that the product is no longer good. Although it might in fact be, but they, they think it's not good anymore. And yeah, uh, people also expect at the same time products not to contain preservatives, which is a bit contradictory because, for example, if you want to um, reduce browning, uh, you can add a preservative like uh, the sulfite uh, to, to remain the nice color. So you, you have to choose. Do you want like an organic product that's brown as it is supposed to be naturally? Or do you want a not so natural product, but which has the nice yellow uh, color? All right, with that, I'd like to conclude on the on the presentation part and move on to the to the Q and A, for which we have hopefully uh, ten more minutes. Yashika, yes, I, I will. Yeah, I will raise a few questions, Casper, uh, with the yeah, please. Animation. Uh, so, uh, so. Uh, we have a question. Uh, do you have an idea of by which countries that jackfruit products mainly come to EU? In which forms, please? What are the main yeah. suppliers uh, of jackfruits to Europe? Is it India or is it another country? Is it? Yeah. Uh, uh, for, for um, cause I honestly, I, I would have to check, but uh, the, the information is definitely in the, in the studies. And there you can also uh, see, um, let's say the, the, the trade statistics available. Uh, from uh, from which countries the products are coming from, um, uh, to get an idea of the of the competition you can expect. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the next one is: uh, What is the most people are uh, like in EU jackfruit in glass or metal cans? Uh, what is the preference of having the jackfruit uh, uh, in glass or metal cans? Yeah. Um, both are uh, widely accepted, cans and um, glass jars. Uh, I, maybe there's like a small preference amongst consumers looking for high quality products to have glass jars. Uh, also because glass jars allow you to see the product. So it's, yeah, it's, it's it provides this transparency that some consumers like because if it's yeah if you can see the product then um uh, that provides more trust in the in the quality of the product but yeah glass is heavy and so comes at a cost uh in terms of transportation uh it's also more expensive generally um so let's say most suppliers are using cans right so uh with the uh time limitation uh it's time to wind up our session so 
thank you uh, mr casper for your insightful presentation it gave a lot of valuable knowledge for sri lanka processed food sector um, as mentioned earlier edb has published the market study conducted by sipo uh, expert on the swiss and european market for processed food from sri lanka uh, in the edb official website so let me show you the location where you can access the report and obtain more insights in edb website I hope you can see the screen. Yes. Right. Uh, this is uh, Sri Lanka Export Development Board official website. Uh, you may visit for Sri Lanka exporters. There are explore export markets. There are market profiles. Click on that. And you will be directed to this page here under food and beverage sector you can download this uh, market study full study is there all the discuss points and uh, more information uh, you can download it from here right uh, in the meantime i would like to invite you to answer the poll uh, display on your screen on this webinar series uh, your feedback will be important uh, for us to plan our next programs uh, so we cordially invite all of you to um, answer the poll questions so uh, with that note, uh, we have come to the end of the webinar series jointly organized by EDB and SIPO. So my sincere thank goes to the Embassy of Switzerland in Sri Lanka, Swiss Import Promotion Program and State Secretariat for Economic Affairs uh, of Sri Switzerland uh, for providing this valuable market intelligence session for Sri Lanka. Uh, Moreover, I would like to appreciate the active participation of all of you and hope you gain valuable insight from this webinar to develop uh, your export business.